is Manna Kalimian, who is the founder and president of the Canna Foundation, also the author of a book called Born to Rewild. And we're going to talk about this concept, Amanda, of rewilding, which I had never heard of before. So let's just start with the definition and then let's dig a little deeper into it. And why is, why is this an important idea? Go ahead. So first of all, Jane, thank you for having me. And uh, as I said before, thank you for your foresight and forward thinking about rewilding. So the definition of rewilding from an environmental place means bringing things back to an original state of being. So, you know, we understand environmentally, you know, we cannot go back to the beginning of time, right? As we can't go back to the Pleistocene era, but we can rebuild our environmental systems the way they are today. Okay, and then you particularly are interested in horses and the rewilding of horses. So that means, tell me if I'm wrong, letting them kind of run free in their normal habitat. Well, so yes, they are <laughs> running free right now in, their, in what is their habitat, but the government isn't really um, acknowledging them as a native species to the North American fauna okay. and allowing them to perform their physiological function mm -hmm. as a mega herbivore. Okay. And um, why is that an important thing? So can I, let me give you a quick little bit of history about what's happening with the horses for, okay. because uh, most people don't know this. Mm -hmm. So we have wild horses in this country and the wild horses belong to the American people. And the wild horses are mandated through the Wild Horse and Burrow Act to roam free on our public lane, public rangelands. And the public rangelands belong to the American people as well. We are all taxpayers and we pay taxes to make sure that the government oversees our public rangelands and our forests. And in that, the wild horses as well. All of these things are under the purview of the Bureau of Land Management. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, Wild Horse and Burrow Act was put into effect oh, 50 years. It was 50 years, uh, mid-December 2021. It was 50 years that the act was passed, which says that the horse is an integral part of the natural system, should be considered, and is protected here. How would you feel if I told you that the government is spending 120 million of your federal tax dollars every year to chase down horses with helicopters, round them up, put them in what they call government holding facilities, slaughtering some of them, inhumanely sterilizing them, all so that they can lease the land that these horses are mandated to live on to farmers. Mm, okay. So, and, and there is an environmental thing besides just, you know, what seems like cruel treatment of horses, there is an environmental benefit to having these horses rewild as well. Exactly. So my question is separate from the cruelty to the horses, is that the way you, the taxpayer want your money spent? Or would you rather see your tax dollars managed proper grazing practices, sharing of the land and utilizing the horses and the cattle and buffalo and the wolf as the predator and rebuilding an ecosystem that is going to help us sequester carbon. Grasslands are the largest um, opportunity that we have even more than forests we're learning to sequester carbon. Now, you mentioned like some of the uses for the land. So lithium, which we know is, you know, part of electric vehicle batteries. And yes. we've got a big push there. Um, cattle farming. I mean, that's a, a business. Is there a way that all these different entities with very different interests can work together? Uh, absolutely. The thing is, we need to, first of all, if I can say, Jane, we, we really have little choice. If, if we don't, if all the factions don't come to the table, it really won't matter if all the horses are gone because the land won't be of any value anyway. 
right? You won't be able to ranch your cattle there because climate change is destroying. It's the mega drought out west, the heat domes, Mm -hmm. the erratic weather patterns. So taking the horses off, blaming the horses for all of this, it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, there won't be any land for you anyway. And, And if I could just say, you know, the there are so many things that this climate change is affecting. It's affecting all of us. It's affecting energy resource. It's affecting commodities. It's affecting, I mean, that is what is making the prices of everything go up and down is climate change. Mm -hmm. So really, if we find a better way to work together with the horses and put proper and, uh, and accept them as a mega herbivore that has a key place in our in our environmental system and we practice new grazing practices that we can attain from our partners in europe rewilding europe their goal is is to be carbon neutral and to stop climate change and they are having tremendous success bringing back you know almost animals that have almost been extinct fauna and flora that has almost been extinct and rebuilding biodiversity Mm -hmm. in the fight for climate change. So what would your ideal solution be? The ideal solution is that we have to all come to the table. It's not one thing or another, right? We need to come together with the government, with agricultural factions, and we need to practice better grazing practices. There are ways to graze your animals and to share the land in a way that is is sustainable. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amanda, for explaining this. It's a brand new concept to me. I enjoyed learning about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.